Hey everyone, thanks for rejoining me on this garage rebuild series here. In this part, I'll show you how I connected all of my electrical system here. This will include the can lighting and lighting outlets in the ceiling, and of course all of the framing that had to go into the ceiling to make that all ready for drywall. Uh, the two-way switches to turn on or off the main lighting on either side of the garage. This also includes the outdoor lighting and the garage door opener circuit. It also includes the 220 circuit to the compressor and the shop lighting and wiring. So stay tuned to see how I did it. So for framing, as I mentioned before, what the builders did for me is they added a cross beam every 48 inches. So every other one of these, the builders did. They did that before the roofing, and the reason they did it was not because they they cared about my ceiling, but because they were plumbing the walls together, and they ha they needed some sort of cross brace at the top to plumb the walls together. I had to add th the extra one, and I think this is a better example over here. So that's one the builders put in, that's one the builders put in, split the difference, 24 inches on center, that's the one I added. You can see it's not tied to the roofing trusses because at 24 inches it doesn't line up, but I put a little block in there and toenailed it in, and it's uh, in there. So I added every other one, I added a new 18 foot beam. If I were to do it all over again, I would have asked the builder to do that. It would have been much easier for them to do that, and it probably wouldn't have cost very much more in terms of labor or materials. The reason being is because after the roof is in, the way we had to do this was thankfully I have the scaffolding. My brother was up on the scaffolding. He would, we'd, we'd lay the, the, the board, the two by six flat. My brother would put it on his shoulder I stood on the floor with a strap over the beam, pulling it down and bowing it so that he had enough room to, to get it up into that slot. So we had at least three to four inches on either side to sill it inside there. And of course we cut our little relief on the end so, so it could sit under the roof. That was a pain in the butt. It would have been a lot easier for them to do it at the same time they were doing all these other cross members before the roof was installed. The next thing is on this edge here, notice that I added some two by six blocking from the corner and about every, you know, two feet or so. It's sometimes it's like maybe 16 inches to no more of a 24 inch on center gap. And what that's for is, and you know, this is one thing that you might miss and you might start drywalling and realize you have nothing to screw the, the ceiling into on the ends. If, you don't put in some blocking to overlap and then allow you to screw in your ceiling drywall on the edges. So I did that all the way across. Then notice that I've got blocking going. Now this is something I probably would have not had the builder do because it probably would have cost money and labor. It takes time to do this, you know, measure each one. They're all different and cut each block to the size that it needs to be but it adds a lot of rigidity. So basically what I did was I measured about 60 inches, about five feet, which makes kind of breaks it up by a third. So third, half, and then another third, you know. And so I started that block over there and then I ran out. But that gives you an idea of what I'm doing on both sides. I'm blocking all the way across, which will tie all these ceiling uh, beams in and make it one, one solid unit. So it, there's no lateral movement. So I started that one. I'm going to do the other, the same on this side. On the center, I added these truss style things. Now I want to be careful with what I say because they're not actually, it's not actually creating a truss. I'm basically just side nailing about three or four nails in on each side and just kind of nailing it together. It looks kind of like a truss and it acts kind of like a truss, but it doesn't have the mending plates and the, and the proper fasteners to call the truss. But this, what this does is add stability to the middle of the ceiling. But it also does a second thing in, in that if you tie it to the roof, it can help with 
sagging of the middle of a roof when you have a long roof, especially with these center beam, these traditional center beam type things. But mainly it adds structure. And I can tell you that from hanging on that after I added them, it does make this a lot more rigid. So I did that on every, about every other one. I didn't do it on the, the first couple because they're so close to the, you know, the tie into the other structure. I didn't feel like it needed it. But I'll be adding, you see, I've done four of them at this point and I still have a few more to go. And I just eyeballed it. They're not perfectly centered or anything, but I think that'll add a lot of structure. So once I finish all this blocking on both sides and I have all these done, that's the finished ceiling. And that's the end, hopefully, of all the framing. This is scaffolding that I'm able to borrow from a friend of mine, so I don't have to rent it. It's a little bit old and, and a little bit beat up, but it works. I can tell you this, out of 12 foot ceiling and trying to do this type of work, if you don't have scaffolding, I don't know how you would do this. I mean, getting on a ladder in the middle here would be an absolute nightmare. If you don't rent scaffolding or don't think you can get scaffolding, have your contractor do it because it's absolutely necessary. This has saved me a lot of time and you know, trying to do something like this on a ladder, I'd probably be dead by now. <laughs> yeah, uh, you need scaffolding. The other thing I would say you probably need, and what I have is a pneumatic nail gun, uh, a framing nailer to do this type of stuff. Yes, I've done some of it with screws and an uh, impact driver, but it's so much quicker to pop nails in, especially when I'm climbing on this thing like a jungle gym to get way up in there and pop those nails in. It's much easier just to do it with a nailer and you don't have to worry about, you know, setting a screw and having two hands to do that. So if you don't feel like you can do that, you don't can't rent scaffolding, have the contractor do it. And here is the completed ceiling framing. You can see I have all the blocking and those little truss type things all the way down to the front of the garage. So next step is the electrical and I'll bring you back in when I show you some progress. All right, well, sorry if this is a little dark. I had to close the garage door in order to film. I've got all the conduit in and ready to start pulling wires. Not only that, but I also have all of the conduit whips anchored in and run to the can lighting. And everything's looking pretty good. Just as a, an aside here, I'm using conduit, EMT steel conduit. And the reason for that is I live in Illinois and our code is pretty strict for electrical. We can't just run Romex all around and through the walls and all that stuff. Conduit's a pain to work with. But the nice thing about conduit is once you get it done, you're sure to pretty much not have problems with it. An animal can't get up in my attic and chew through my wiring. There's just no way that's going to happen if everything's steel. The other thing that's a slight advantage is that steel conduit in our code, if it's an interior wiring, it becomes your ground. So you don't need to run all these extra ground wires the steel conduit becomes your ground. Now there's some exceptions to that for like external hardwired appliances like air conditioners or, or hardwired generators, but for interior, it becomes your ground and you don't have to run that extra green ground wire. When you have to do short runs, we're allowed to use that armor light whip. And if you've ever priced out armor light whips that are pre-built in different sizes, like, you know, 10 foot and six foot and all that, you'll notice that it's quite costly. And I had to do, what, six of these, plus a few extras in here, even like a little short one run like that, I went ahead and just did with a whip. Uh, it just, makes it a little bit easier. Now we're allowed up to, I think, a 12 foot whip for like lighting and stuff like that, or if you want to have to run it through your walls. But the cheapest way to do this is to buy 
a lot of it, like a 50 foot, instead of buying the pre-made with the ends, buy just the raw 50 foot armor light cabling and then buy some of the insulated bushings, those red things. And then finally you'll buy like those ends, you know, like the either the push-in style or the other style ends. And they're pretty easy to put together. You just cut it to length peel back the armor light surround to expose about four or five inches of wire on each side, put the bushing in, crimp it up a little bit, and then put the box end on the end and you're done. I made a lot, most of these whips and only took me like a couple minutes each for each one to make. Well, problem here is I got all my whips here done, but I have a half inch end coupling for this whip but this box only has one inch and three quarter inch knockouts. So how do I add this into there? The answer is get some reducing washers or reducing bushings. This is three quarter to half inch. There's two washers in here and they usually come two or four to a pack. And there's the reason for that is you need one on the outside and one on the inside. I also swapped out the whip end here with the, uh, instead of the push in style, it's the threaded on style and because I don't think the pushing ones will work with that those washers and there it is got the washer on the inside washer on the outside and it's all locked in now the goal of this electro goal I've got my panel here and I've got like just probably only this is only 60 amps so I only have like one two three four five circuits this being the 220 circuit there's not that much going on. So what I'm going to do is the 220 and one of these circuits is going to be the, the well, this is the 220 for the, that's going to run to the workshop, to the compressor. And then there's one 15 amp uh, circuit that's going to run to the workshop for all the rest of the lighting and outlets. It's not much, but there's only, you know, me working in here. So I, you know, and it, LED lighting and just a few outlets is all that's in the workshop at this point. So the rest of the, we have the 20 amp, and that's already done. So I've ran this outlet, I run conduit, a half inch piece of conduit all the way up and around, and I ran it over to there. That's the entire outlet wiring for the garage. And you might be saying, why are you doing that? Well, I'm in the center of the garage, so I've got an outlet there and an outlet way up there on the wall. And the idea behind this outlet here is I'm going to, once I put the drywall on, I'll put the drywall on over that piece of conduit. I'll cut that conduit down and I'm gonna slide another four inch box over the top of that and fasten it to the stud where that's coming through the back. And so that'll be in a, a box on the outside of the drywall. That box will have a outlet in it and then I'll hang this guy right here, which is covered in sawdust, but I'll clean that up. But that's a 40 foot retractable reel. It's 12 gauge wire with three outlets on the end of it. That's gonna be hanging up there. I'll also probably, if I end up doing a workbench over here in this corner, what I might do is, after, again, after the drywall is up, just run a piece of conduit nice and straight over, and then just, I could tap anything off I want to. I can also run another piece of conduit off here if I want something over here, or I can run it up if I wanted something up toward the ceiling. So I have all those options and I don't care to put outlets inside the wall because they just never make sense to me in a garage. In a garage, I would just rather have just a couple outlets in the center and uh, you know 20 amp heavy duty outlets with 20 amp heavy duty cabling and some outlet packs on the ground. Pretty much in the garage when I need power, most of the time I need it on the ground somewhere because I'm doing some grinding or whatever and I've got a, a, a corded tool that I need to plug in. I don't see any reason to put outlets in like eight every eight feet like that's in a house like down below here. There's just no reason for that in a garage in my opinion. Again, this is just my opinion. You can do whatever you want. But that's the methodology there. That one circuit is just going to have those two outlets. And then there's, gonna, there's two other 15 amp circuits left. One's going to be dedicated to the garage door opener. So that's going to run up. Notice this one inch tubing is my main. And that's I've got a box right there. 
And the only reason I did that is for the tandem, the two-way switches or the three-way switches for the main lightings. I have to go over to here for those three extra wires to, for, to that switch and then over to there for those wires on that switch. And I'll show you that in a moment. But that's the main trunk. That's one inch conduit. And it's gonna, most everything's gonna pass through and run all the way to here. From there, we've got three quarter inch conduit and that's splitting. The garage door so circuit's gonna go through that three quarter inch conduit to go up front, catch that, that front light. So that's the only thing that's gonna be on that garage door opener circuit is that front uh, out exterior light that I showed you in my last video. And then it's gonna go over here and catch that outlet for the garage door opener. The other three quarter inch splits off and then goes all the way over into the workshop. That's gonna be the five other wires or the two circuits, the 220 with the three wires and the one other 15 amp circuit for the workshop. So that's gonna be the totality of the wiring and I will show you when I'm, I'm done with that. I think the methodology for how I'm gonna pull is to pull a couple circuits at a time up, you know, from, um, we'll push them through the, um, up from the panel. And then, like I said, up that main trunk and then where is it going? And then into there and then a lot of stuff into there. What I'm also going to do is I found this, I have had this for a while. This is a big spool of 18 solid core, 18 gauge green wire. And you're like 18 gauge, that's kind of useless. Well, yeah, the, the point of this wire was at, to use as a like a burial wire for a pet fence, like one of those electronic uh, pet collar things. And so it's just a cheap, pretty much unusable wire. I can't, 18 gauge, I can't use it for really anything. Um, so what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna feed it from some of the uh, outside uh, places, the destinations, feed it back through you know, like some of these outlets, the, the, these switch outlets here, and feed it back through. I have these long runs where I need to pu uh, pull wire. And so as I'm pushing from here, if something gets stuck, I've got pull wires in different locations to then also be able to pull on it and shake on it. And so hopefully that will get all the wires where I need to go. One thing that I, I'm sure that I'm, I'm tempted to do, because I'm not a pro professional electrician, is to just the pull the wires, get them to the first box, and then cut them there, and then start feeding wires maybe from that box over, and then splice them in, and then pull wires through there, and then splice them in there. I'm trying to be mindful of getting all my wires pulled through and not breaking them until they get to the destination, unless they need to be split. So a lot of the workshop wiring is gonna go into here, but it's not gonna stop there. It's just gonna continue right through there. And even then, a lot of those wires that don't need to be split are not gonna stop there. I'm gonna pull them up through that fitting and then hopefully pull them all the way through unbroken and unspliced and only splice where I absolutely need to. So that's the goal uh, and wish me luck. Quick progress shot here. I've got this bundle wire, which is gonna be the workshop the two circuits for the workshop, the 220 and the 110 circuit, the 15 amp circuit. I've got the wires bundled. I've also noticed have a, a feeder wire, that green, bundled in with this. So this, once I pull this through, I'll have another pull wire because I already ran a pull wire up. You notice I've got it taped into here and that's going all the way up to there and so that's my pull wire for this bundle. But then once I pull this bundle through, I'll decouple that one and then I'll have a pull wire left over to do the remaining two circuits, the garage door opener circuit and the lighting circuit. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to get this thing pulled at least up to there. Then I'm gonna run a pull wire from the workshop back through here and then attempt to pull those wires up through that conduit that way. Also, I should note, since my hands are going to be in this panel here, I have shut it down from the main panel. So this entire panel is dead right now. All right. Well, so far, some success here. We got our middle junction box, all of our wires for the workshop, plus my another pole wire pulled through here. Here you see there, this box is just being, they're forwarding them through. 
Uh, this box is just mainly for the main lighting splits. And there it is down there. It really does help to have two people. I got grabbed my wife and had her push from the bottom as I'm pulling. So when you get stuck on like an elbow or a fitting, you can kind of together kind of wiggle a little, but all you really need is one person pushing, one person pulling, and it goes pretty smooth. We'll see how it does on the other, those two other circuits that I gotta run while those wires are already in the conduit. Cause you know, when the conduit's empty, it's a little bit easier but I'll keep moving and bring you back in when I get some more pr progress. Well, I'm definitely over the hill on the electrical, so things are going all right. I've got all of my breakers tied in. All the main home runs are done. Like I said, as long as you get that pull wire through, you can do that in different phases. Things are going to there. A lot of stuff's going in there. The workshop home run is done. The garage door opener home run, the hot wire ended up there. The neutral is behind the garage door uh, because it has to be split to the light. Now all I'm doing is just the, you know, finishing work. I'm wiring in, like tying in the outlets, tying in the wiring up in the junction boxes. So I did that outlet up there, tied, you know, the lights in. And I'm just going to continue doing that and then I'll be able to test everything. Well, finally, I have... A good update here all of the circuits are wired and they are all on so we have the garage door opener outlet wired up I don't have the garage door opener installed yet but that will take place soon I have the switches here this one is on the garage door opener circuit but that is that front light that will just remain on since I have the uh, motion sensor on it here is the main lighting switch I'm gonna go ahead and switch it on and you can see we do have lights now. The lights are just kind of hanging there because the uh, bulb holder goes on the trim piece. So I'm just having hanging there for testing. I did test the outlets for the shop lights that are in the middle of the ceiling here. That one, that one, and that one. And all of my can lights are functioning. So that's really good news. And I spent a lot of time trying to wire this tandem switch up here. So of course on the other side we have this switch for that back floodlight and then this switch here is a tandem switch for the main lighting. So we can turn it on and off on either side. Back in the workshop here, it's quite dark. I've added this switch next to the door. I had to take my whole compressor setup out that I did on one of my videos. This whole thing with this copper tubing and all that. So the compressor right now is completely disconnected from the air side of things. When you flip the switch, get some lighting in here, now all my shop lights work. So that's very cool. I also got all my outlets working too. So basically I just ran all this conduit here, ran that over and over, over to here. And I tapped off my, uh, my circuits coming in. And then so that outlet there runs this light and that's on the switch. And then all the rest of these outlets are on constant power. And then of course the 220 comes down, ends up there. I've got some, some extra wire nuts uh, so that I can tap off that and run it back over here for my car charging circuit. But as you can see the compressor switch is on and if I want to run that I can now run my compressor so we have everything wired up so I'm pretty happy about that the only additions I'll, I'll make is probably just tapping off that 220 to put my car charger right there which I can do anytime later um, and I may before drywall is in I just realized I might want an exterior set of outlets so I might just tap off this this outlet here and put an exterior outlet on the uh, east side of that structure but other than that we are done with electrical what I'm gonna do on my um, on the next clip right here is I'm gonna wait for tonight and I'm gonna demonstrate how I can come in from the dark and see where I'm going whether I'm coming through this door or the service door and how I can switch on the lighting Okay, it's dark out now. What I'm gonna do is demonstrate how I can get into the garage or the workshop and how I can utilize the lighting to see my way over there in the dark. 
So first I'm in my house, I'm gonna turn on my outdoor light and my post light. And that way I can see on the back of my porch here. And with that post light, I can see kind of up to about here. As I'm walking up to my garage, I might have to adjust the sensitivity, but it should eventually see me. It did. I'm going to adjust the sensitivity a little bit more so it can catch me about 10 foot sooner. Now, as I'm walking to the side, I got this one set up really nice with really good sensitivity to see me as soon as I make that corner around the front of the garage. And this allows me a lot of light all over here and I can see how to get into my door. This is the service door to the workshop. And all I have to do is feel around and I can get to my switch here. And then I got plenty of light in the workshop to see my way around. Now as I'm walking into the garage area, I've got that light wired up to the workshop lighting and that illuminates this area here so I can see to get to my switch, which then I can turn on my main lighting. And of course, remember that I'm gonna have a bunch of shop lights plugged into those outlets, so this'll be really nice and bright. Now, when coming in from the garage door, I've started wiring up the garage door opener. I'm getting the sensors in now, that's on a separate video. But once that's done, when the garage door opens, you might wonder that jack shaft style garage door opener, unlike a chain drive unit, doesn't have any lights on it. So what do you do when you open the door from the garage and it's dark in here? Well, they give you this dome light included with the kit. It plugs in to a socket here, but it communicates with the, the unit communicates to that via Bluetooth. So what I'm going to do is plug it into that same outlet that I have the garage door opener plugged in. And once I drywall the ceiling, I can just mount that dome light right in this corner here. So when the garage door opener opens, and if I walk in through the front, there'll be, there'll be some lighting right here, which is enough to illuminate this switch, which again is a toggle for our main lighting. I'll have a, a couple other videos coming up. One is I'm finishing the insulation and I'm going to be doing the drywall. So I'll do a video showing you the after effects of, of finishing the drywall and what the kind of the finished walls and ceiling look like in the shop. Another video will be on installing this jack shaft style garage door opener. I'll do another video of that. So if anybody has a garage door opener like this or is interested in a garage door opener like this, they kind of have an idea how to install it. Thanks so much for visiting me on this part, and I'm happy with the progress here. Hopefully you are learning something and being inspired for your own garage build project, and I'll see you on the next one.